This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Strip malls line arterial streets all over the United States. They're there for when you need a Red Bull or your nails done, but otherwise they sort of fade into the background. They are overshadowed by larger power centers anchored by the targets and best buys of the world, as well as enclosed shopping malls. They may not be fancy, but they are finely tuned efficient land uses. They exist in the Venn diagram overlap zone of convenience, car culture, and capitalism. Love them or hate them, there are now over 65,000 strip malls lining roads all over the United States. In this video, we'll learn how they became so perfectly adapted to their auto-oriented environment, and take the story all the way back to their humble origins in the 1920s. One of the reasons strip malls sort of fade into the background is due to their sameness. Whether they were built four years ago or 40 years ago, they all have the same basic elements. This isn't a coincidence, but in fact, one of the keys to their success. Nearly all strip malls have their stores run parallel to the street. At intersections, strip malls form L's. This is because visibility is critical. The stores themselves are the signs that draw in potential customers. You rarely see tall signs for strip malls flagging down cars. If anything, maybe a low sign out front. But the entablature zone of the strip mall is the focal point. It's easy to scan across and see all of the businesses in the strip mall. Once a potential customer spots a store that they would like to visit, the next step is getting into the parking lot. Now this is another potential visibility issue because if they can't figure out how to get into the parking lot, they may pass right on by. The entrances, known as curb cuts, need to be easy to see and pull into. If there's a building blocking the view of one, or if there are too many unlabeled curb cuts nearby, it can confuse our shopper and they may pass right on by. Strip malls on corners will have entrances on both streets, cashing in on their location advantage. Our shopper must then park their car. Strip malls have their parking right in front for a couple of reasons. First, customers are more likely to stop when they can see that there is available parking. Seeing their parking spot even before they pull in is a powerful draw. Parking in front also maximizes the convenience factor. Our shopper can pull right up to the front door of the nail salon. This is unlikely to happen at a power center where a traffic lane separates the parking from the store or at an enclosed mall where you have to, you know, go into the mall to get to the stores. One challenge of strip mall design is determining the correct amount of parking. You want to have enough parking so that there's always an available space. That's typically about five spaces per 1,000 feet of retail. At the same time, you don't want the parking lot to be too deep. If the stores themselves are their own billboards, deep parking lots can obscure them. Typically, a strip mall will cover only about 25% of the parcel, maybe less. The parcel is basically a large parking lot that makes some room for stores. In fact, the parking lot is usually designed before the building itself. The dimensions of the parking lot matter, and so too do the dimensions of the strip mall itself. A typical retail storefront is about 20 feet wide. Now, a strip mall wants to be able to lease space to small shops, as small as 1,000 or 1,500 square feet. Using some math, we can deduce that a strip mall should be somewhere between 50 and 75 feet deep, and certainly not deeper than 100 feet. A strip mall that is too deep can die because it effectively has too much space. This is why strip malls are long and skinny. It gives them the flexibility to host small shops, but it also gives plenty of frontage to larger tenants. It's also important not to have a strip mall too long. People don't want to walk too far from one end to the other. 300 feet is considered a good maximum length. The other dimension to consider is height. Why don't strip mall developers add a second story? The simple answer here is that retailers assume that shoppers are too lazy to climb stairs and are unwilling to lease second story space. A strip mall could lease that space to office tenants, but those tenants would compete for valuable parking space during the hours of nine to five. For these reasons, strip malls are typically one story. All of these factors contribute to the incredibly focused efficiency and the invisibility of the strip mall. This ruthless efficiency meant that strip malls were destined to take over America's suburban retail landscape. Their promise was identified early on. The first shopping centers we would identify as strip malls began appearing in the 1920s, like Ye Marketplace in Los Angeles. The car was becoming more popular and it didn't take long to translate a shopping street made for pedestrians, with buildings lining up against the sidewalk, to a shopping strip separated from the street by a parking lot. By the 1930s, publications like Architectural Record were publishing shopping center parking schemes for general use. These pre-war strip malls were more charming than what we expect of strip malls today. These older ones still have some pedestrian amenities and architectural detail, carryovers from their origins in the streetcar era. 
The post-war year saw the strip mall really come into its own. Designers doubled down on no-nonsense efficiency in the 1950s. Architects at the time called them machines for selling, and this was the first decade they were referred to as strip malls. They were built by the dozen in cities across the United States. Amenities like bathrooms and gardens were eliminated. Their design aesthetic was labeled as plain modern. Their designers felt the style conveyed the convenience and efficiency of the strip mall. They thought flashier designs would turn away regular Joes and look dated more quickly. This aesthetic also fell in line with America's adoption of modernist architecture during the same period, so the strip mall was not at all out of place. In the 1950s, strip malls were riding the suburbanization wave. Consumers saw them as shopping for the modern auto age. But as the decades went on, the strip mall's natural habitat began to change. In the beginning, strip malls would host institutions typically found downtown, like post offices, banks, churches, and grocery stores. But the car, the very thing that gave rise to the strip mall, also made their lives more difficult. If someone had a car, why would they need to settle for strip mall shopping when they could hop on the interstate and go to a shiny new enclosed mall? The arterial commercial strips were getting passed by, and so too were strip malls. Strip malls saw thrift stores, pawn shops, laundromats, liquor stores, and check cashing businesses fill its storefronts as the banks and grocery stores moved on. Yet, as we know, strip malls are still with us. While some fell upon hard times, others continue to thrive. They also have an important role in supporting immigrant communities. Their low rents mean low barriers to entry for minority-owned businesses. Some strip malls consist entirely of businesses owned by and catering to certain ethnic groups. Strip malls provide a means of upward mobility. Their flexible, efficient design means that they'll continuously adapt to the ever-changing retail landscape. And it's hard to imagine the United States without strip malls. They'll be luring consumers into their parking lot with the promise of dollar store bargains and cheap Little Caesars pizza for decades to come. When I'm not making City Beautiful videos, I'm teaching city planning to college students. I've no natural ability or formal training in video production, audio, social media, or anything like that. But what I do have is a Skillshare premium account that helps me answer questions like, how do I make my audio sound good and how do I keep my video in focus? Skillshare is great for answering these questions because you can find the right answers fast from people who actually know what they're doing. No sifting through random tutorials on other sites. Now, I'm no cinematographer, but I find classes like this DIY cinematography class to be very helpful. I didn't know anything about lighting my subject and setting up a set, and they explained it in a way that has really helped me up my game. I mean, have you seen how this channel has progressed? Skillshare gets some of that credit. If you're looking to learn a new skill or take your hobbies to the next level, consider a Skillshare Premium Membership. The first 1,000 to click the link in the description will get a free trial. And if you decide to stick with it, an annual plan is less than $10 a month. That's a great deal, so go check it out.